Good evening, everyone. It's so wonderful to see you all here um, at the beginning of this new and very energetic year and the beginning of a wonderful semester for all of us. Um, and it's so great to see that the room is full as it should be uh, with our students and what, from what I can tell, most of our faculty, um, faculty from other colleges and school, many of our staff members and some of our retired faculty. Uh, and I think members of the Athens community. So um, these lectures that we have um, are always some of the most joyful occasions that we have, I think, every year. And uh, this one will certainly prove not to be an exception. It could actually very well be uh, one of the most exciting events that we are holding. So um, we are honored here that today we have Eric Graft, and also he has an exhibit, which I'm sure some of you have already been able to attend, uh, which is called The New American Garden, The Landscape Architecture of Omi Van Sweden, which was originally presented in collaboration with the National Building Museum um, in DC, right? Is it open? Or is it part of the government shutdown? I just couldn't afford to, it came to my mind. Anyway, so, and the, exhibit documents the work of the landscape architects through commissioned photographs and archival, archival images. So before I introduce to you our remarkable speaker, I want to thank a few friends uh, without whose support this exhibit and this lecture would not have been possible. So I want to thank for, I, wanna, I want you to join me in thanking Professors Marianne Kramer out there. I just saw her. Here she is. And Professor Brad Davis, right there. So you can't hide. Um, who, uh, who, I think this was actually the original idea uh, from Brad and Marianne to, to have this um, event um, uh, on our campus. Uh, and I also want to thank Susan and Alex McAllister. Susan is now here, uh, who is supporting this event. Um, uh, it would be impossible uh, without her, and I don't want to embarrass Anna, but she's here as well. Um, it, she's her daughter, and she's one of our students. Uh, and of course, many thanks as usual to our gallery director, Melissa Tufts, um, our lecture committee chair, Jennifer Messer, who is right there, and all the students who helped Melissa um, actually with the hanging of the show. So, now the climax. Um, as you may have heard or read, uh, Wolfgang Wimi and James Van Sweden revolutionized landscape architecture with the creation of the New American Garden, a type of garden that is characterized by large swaths of grasses and fields of perennials. Their style celebrated the seasonal splendor of the American meadow while promoting its inherent ecological, sustainable, aesthetic, and ornamental values. So many individuals have worked on these projects that you can see in the exhibition, most notably the three principals of the successor firm, Wemi van Sweden um, OVS, Sheila Brady, Lisa Delplace, and of course, uh, Eric Graft. And they continue the legacy um, of this firm uh, and have taken it to new heights. So we are incredibly honored and happy to have Eric Graft here with us tonight. He is the owner and principal of the firm, and he is a graduate of the University of Virginia, where he earned a Master of Landscape Architecture degree in 1984. He also holds a Bachelor of Arts degree with majors in Geography and Environmental si Science from Shippenburg University of Pennsylvania. He has over 30 years of professional practice, and he, of course, is, has also widely taught and lectured around the country. He is a registered landscape architect and a fellow of the American Society of Landscape Architects. So please join me in welcoming our distinguished speaker tonight, Mr. Eric Groff. Thank you, Dean. First, can everyone hear me? Good, I project pretty well. And then, I, second question is, who wants to be in my Instagram feed? Yeah. Wave your hand, wave your hand, wave your hand. Very good, very good. So um, I want to start, uh, those of you who have been sitting for a while saw the uh, feed we had on here with the uh, live website for the Cultural Landscape Foundation. And I really have to start by crediting Charles Birnbaum 
and, uh, and, the, and the organization of which I'm, I'm actually on the board. Uh, it was really his idea to put this exhibition together. Uh, and it was commemorating uh, the first book that Jim Van Sweden and Wolfgang Numa put together, Bold Romantic Gardens. Uh, and uh, the 25th anniversary was about uh, three years ago. And of the 21 gardens that are featured in that book, um, nine no longer exist. So it's Charles's uh, and the Cultural Landscape Foundation's concern that landscapes get lost. So we wanted to uh, recognize that fact and as a, as a way to preserve some of the gardens that we've lost and some that are still existing that are in the exhibition, uh, that was really the foundation for uh, uh, the exhibition itself. It's a part of a, it's part of the landslide um, series that the foundation does that um, it, it is, documents landscapes that are threatened or lost. Um, it's part of three exhibitions that are now rotating through the country and I'd like to, to encourage um, the University of Georgia to bring the other two in as well. Uh, one on Dan Kiley um, that's been out for a number of years now and the recently opened um, Halperin uh, exhibition, both uh, all really incredible. And as I've been traveling the country with this exhibition, I've seen the value of kind of bringing the designers into the actual studio. So I'd, I'd like to really encourage um, uh, both of those shows uh, coming here as well. <clears throat> I'm going to just start with a uh, my, a little intro um, and ode to my, uh, my great mentors, uh, Jim and Wolfgang. <clears throat> when our founding principals, Wolfgang Uma and James Van Sweden, began working as Uma Van Sweden 35 years ago, I guess it's closer to 40 now, green wasn't a movement or a message. It did not announce the organic provenance of a consumer item or describe the work or the attitudes of an individual or organization. They simply did the right thing. Jim and Wolfgang have rightly been called the grandfathers of green. And I would further argue that the work of Uma Van Sweden has done as much to introduce sustainability into our great civic landscapes, as well as the gardens of ordinary people as that of any other landscape architecture firm working over the last several decades. And they did it without Facebook or Twitter. <laughs> Instead, Jim and Wolfgang relied on another and more timeless medium, beauty. Sustainability is an extremely worthy goal, but there are many ways to go about achieving it. Uma Van Sweden Associates pushed the public in that direction by introducing a new concept of beauty to the American people an aesthetic based on nature and its systems. It came to be called the new American garden style and constituted, according to many, a landscape revolution. Under the direction of Jim and Wolfgang and recruits like me and my fellow second gen uh, partners, Lisa Del Place and Sheila Brady, gardens and public landscapes were infused with movement and color. Now freed from forced and artificial forms, layered masses of foliage captured and celebrated the ephemeral by <clears throat> registering changes in light, wind, and season. The New American Garden was and continues to be a viable alter alternative to the typical American garden scene. It's more relaxed, less like a formula, and much more sympathetic to the environment than water and fertilizer hungry lawns and foundation plantings. In fact, plants that compose the New American Gardens, especially perennials and or ornamental grasses, require less maintenance, no deadheading or pesticides, and only limited water and organic fertilizers. These plants and their caretakers welcome seasonal and botanical change. What's more, these plants prove themselves again and again in both formal and informal architectural settings. I sometimes wonder if the revolution could have taken place anywhere but in our nation's capital. 
I suggest that because in addition to the wonderful private gardens the firm has had the opportunity to work on over the years, the public commissions, including the German-American Friendship Garden, our ongoing work at the Federal Reserve Campus, the World War II Memorial, and the Martin Luther King Memorial, all on the mall, now are under construction, have all given a vast spectrum of the American public, and we are hardly a nation of gardeners, exposure to a new and happily low maintenance form of planting they might not ever have experienced back in the heartland. OVS has offered a new and broader palette of color, texture, and form for landscape architects and gardeners to choose from, but another measure of success is the New American Garden's adaptability to a variety of architectural styles. OVS is known for its love of plants and willingness to experiment, yes, but also rely extensively on architecture to ensure that both the site and the structures merge to make a singular statement. Instilling every landscape with appropriate architectural structure or bones and embracing the vernacular of the site is key to our signature style. The genius of a place is created rather than discovered. Marrying built elements and site through the design of a garden that highlights the best elements of each is our goal as landscape architects. Whatever the place, be it a public plaza or park, and whatever the style, be it a streamlined modern beach house or a historic New England home, every landscape is essentially a garden whose purpose is to convey the beauty of nature and the pulse of its rhythms directly to the people who move through it every day. Now let's look at some gardens. <clears throat> just a, a little, I can't even see what I'm ah. saying here. Anyway, just a little bit about us. Uh, we're a multidisciplinary uh, firm, uh, and that comes from our founding uh, partners. Um, uh, we're a woman-owned business. My uh, partners, Lisa and Sheila, uh, share it with me. And we're about at uh, 25 uh, professional uh, staff right now. You know, these are just some of our, um, our, our phil philosophy and what makes us uh, uh, who we are. Um, human connectivity and ecological systems is something that uh, we like to fuse together. Um, and uh, it's, it's all about preserving, rehabilitating, restoring landscape environs uh, wherever, uh, wherever we wind up going. Our uh, foundation is with Wolfgang Uma and Jim Van Sweden. Wolfgang was trained as a horticulturalist and landscape architect in Germany, immigrated uh, in 1957. Uh, Jim Van Sweden was trained as an architect, uh, had an early career in um, urban planning, got a degree in landscape architecture, uh, and when he sold his planning uh, firm, uh, called Wolfgang, uh, and they, their first commission was uh, Jim's private home in Georgetown. Yes. Can you turn the lights just a bit? Oh, yeah. Somebody can help, I think. Can the lights be dimmed? They were off a minute ago. That'll make a big difference. Thank you. There we go. Much better. So our foundation is in Washington, D.C. with Jim Van Sweden's garden uh, in Georgetown. Um, I like to, uh, I start every new region that we work in with a, uh, uh, a map. Um, I'm a geographer, uh, number one, uh, before I became a landscape architect. And uh, in our office, we're very concerned about where we are and uh, particularly uh, what uh, watershed uh, we're in. In this particular case, of course, we've, we're right at the kind of apex of the Potomac River uh, and the Anacostia River. And this is about uh, uh, 50 miles before the Potomac River empties into the Chesapeake Bay. So this is the first uh, collaboration between Jim and Wolfgang. This is Jim's garden in Georgetown. It's uh, 17 feet by 55 feet. Um, it really got a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, excitement in, in Washington uh, for its four season uh, possibilities and also uh, the way in the middle of summer, it almost gave uh, Jim a, a tropical feel uh, 
in, in this very small uh, urban space. Uh, and that same thing uh, transferred into, through all the seasons, into the winter and also 24 hours a day. Lighting's very important uh, in, in our gardens as well. We've then gone on to do several hundred Georgetown Gardens. It seems like we always have a couple um, uh, on the boards uh, at, any, at any given time. These are just, uh, this is a, uh, one garden in particular that we've done for four different owners. We keep adding, uh, adding on over the course of time. Our first big uh, break was um, back in the early 80s. <laughs> this is the Federal Reserve Campus. It's all over structure, and we remain working on this today. Actually, we're on the boards right now as we're actually going to lift this up. Uh, the garage underneath this garden needs to, be, needs to have the waterproofing redone. So this entire garden is going to be uh, re redone again. So it was one of the first uh, roof gardens or uh, gardens on structure in the Washington uh, DC area. We got this commission, uh, Jim and Wolfgang were published, one of their Georgetown gardens had a, a picture on the cover of the Washington Star Sunday magazine with a Hamamalis uh, virginicus, which is um, witch hazel, and the, um, uh, the, the commissioner of the Federal Reserve saw that he had started Toro um, irrigation uh, and was a great gardener. And when he saw the use of witch hazel, which no one was really using uh, at the time, when he saw that, he said, that's who I want to have do the um, uh, redo the gardens at the Federal Reserve. Uh, Wolfgang was unique in that uh, he, he, he was the most passionate person I've ever encountered with plant material. And he was bringing a lot of American natives, smuggling them in his uh, luggage with his annual trips back to uh, his native Germany. One in particular was Black Eyed Susan's, Rebecca Goldstrom, uh, in this, in this uh, <coughs> image. Um, and it was not commercially available in the United States. So he actually smuggled this and many more of the plants that we use in our palette uh, back and together with Kurt Blumel, uh, start, really started the whole uh, native plant uh, movement. And as you can see in this picture, one of our signature styles is we don't plant twos and threes, we actually plant in, in hundreds and thousands. Right after 9-11, we redid all the perimeter security because this is a very um, uh, important uh, complex in, the, in Washington. So. Uh, we try to use the same materials and also integrate um, structure into the garden so that it wasn't just surrounded by bollards. In this case, we, used, we did a planter around the, the existing fountain uh, made of granite, and it was uh, designed and engineered to, to withstand a tank actually running into the building. Within a month, I, I love these little anecdotes, Within a month of uh, us opening this part of the garden uh, with this new perimeter security, a, um, a DC city bus jumped the curb and, and hit uh, this planter. And it actually did uh, stop them from going into the building or, or the fountain. So, so the, the, the first image I had were the original trees that, put, that were put in. This image was taken about uh, 30 years later. Um, uh, so we, they, Jim and Wolfgang must have done something right to, for these trees to have uh, matured so well. Unfortunately, they're all coming out within the next uh, couple of months for, for them to redo uh, the, the uh, waterproofing. Uh, this is Freedom Plaza um, that was uh, designed by Robert Venturi and uh, pretty much looked like this up until the time the Pennsylvania Avenue Development Corporation, uh, which uh, uh, basically w renovated the entire avenue, called on Jim and Wolfgang to kind of spruce this up and, and get some more seasonal interest in there. Uh, we like to call this as the beginning of the uh, landscape revolution when we actually ripped out the taxes uh, to reveal the very expensive um, 
gr uh, granite that was, uh, what was behind it. The taxes was actually uh, covering it up. Uh, here's Jim and Wolfgang uh, planting the v Robert Venturi uh, planters. We're a very hands-on office. Uh, we're actually a hybrid design build, and uh, we really encourage all of our staff uh, to get out there and get their hands dirty, um, as our founding partners did. And then this is just a detail of, uh, after the taxis is removed, uh, we created these little, like, almost shop windows of uh, ornamental uh, native and non and exotic uh, planting to give seasonal interest along nation, the nation's main street. Um, also, this is actually covered in the exhibition. This is Pershing Square, which was originally designed by Paul Freeberg. Uh, it was pretty much all um, junipers uh, with very little seasonal interest. Uh, this is also a, a uh, project, a garden space that is on the, the TCLF landslide uh, list because the Park Service, through lack of funds, has just let this garden uh, go and basically the plants are gone and now it's being redesignated as the World War I uh, memorial. So, and you'll notice uh, these pictures are uh, quite, um, uh, quite showy, and in the exhibition you'll see a couple of slides of how the Park Service, uh, through lack of maintenance, has just let it go. This is a, a roof garden that we did right along the banks of the Potomac River. This is actually a utility vault uh, that the developers that were developing condos um, around the site I wanted to do something rather than just gravel on the roof. This is a view from uh, one of the uh, condominium units. Uh, has a view of um, has a view of uh, of Key Bridge in Washington. A view at, from one of the units looking across this uh, urban meadow to Roslyn, Virginia. I like to say Roslyn never looked so good. Uh, we were also the landscape architects. Uh, that went in, went in on a comp competition with Friedrich San Florian from uh, Rhode Island to design the um, seven-acre site for the World War uh, II memorial. Uh, we called this project World War III in the office because it took a very long time uh, to, uh, to, get, to go through the entire pr approval process that one has to do in the monumental core of Washington. Um, it was a, a mastery of uh, grading and then also tree preservation was a big uh, part of this uh, uh, of this uh, design. We also were the landscape architects of record for the uh, Martin Luther King Memorial that's adjacent to the World War II. Uh, we've done a lot of work on the eastern shore of Virginia. This is actually a, a picture of um, the Chesapeake Bay uh, and the dendritic landscape of the Eastern Shore. Uh, Sherwood is where Jim Van Sweden actually had his uh, second home. Uh, not only did he have these wonderful views of the bay, but he also um, excavated a pond uh, in the front. And showing the twin pavilions, this uh, complex was designed by Suman Sorg, uh, an architect that we've done a lot of work with. And this demonstrating how the um, seeded meadow is on the left and the designed meadow is up uh, closer to the uh, building structures. It's a handrail to get into the swimming pool that Jim designed. He had an affection for snakes. It actually looks like our logo um, as well. And a view from the, uh, from the seeded meadow uh, the main block of the house is uh, where Jim lived, and the um, house on the right is, the, is his guest house. Um, I've done a lot of work in, uh, in the New York metropolitan area. Uh, this is the Rosenberg uh, Terrace on 69th Street. Great urban view. Uh, of course, all of the, these are in containers. Um, and we also did the Rosenberg's Garden out in Water Mill on the east end of Long Island. And this is a garden that um, is also in the uh, ex exhibition. 
the Rosenbergs had a art gallery in New York City where they represented Henry Moore, so we got to uh, uh, locate this um, very important piece by Henry Moore. Just showing you the palette that Jim and Wolfgang established. There's some natives here. We, it's usually about in the 60% range of natives, but then uh, just through client needs, we'll integrate with uh, other uh, more ornamental plants. Uh, these are the uh, shots that are in the exhibition. Then back in Manhattan, uh, the Rosenberg Garden actually inspired uh, us to get the commission to do uh, Rockefeller Park, on the, uh, at, uh, which is part of Battery Park City. Uh, all landscape architects like a blank slate. Here was a landfill um, that uh, was just waiting to be developed. A model of the infill and the park. <laughs> We worked with Carl Lynch Sandel on uh, the design of the park. Uh, from a hardscape perspective, we really wanted this um, uh, part of Battery Park City to be reminiscent of Olmsted's uh, materiality that was used in Central Park. And we brought it right to the edge of, of, uh, uh, of the Hudson. And then we recalled some of the same plant material that may have been along the Hudson uh, before man. We, that was one of our prerequisites. Of course, again, layered with um, seasonal color and texture. It's interesting, uh, uh, after Sandy, uh, this park was, didn't look so great, but uh, a lot of these ornamental grasses and natives will pop right back up um, after they get knocked down by a storm. Uh, this is a a client that I've had, it was my first client when I came to work for Jim and Wolfgang. This is her uh, townhouse garden at One Beekman Place near the UN. Of you, that was a model. A lot of our clients really don't understand design, don't understand uh, drawings, so it's important that we, we do models for all you students. Um, it's, it's a real important, uh, real important tool. And here we see the uh, fountain uh, designed outside of the living room. Barbara is a great uh, 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 plants person and uh, wanted as much green as she could in this very tight urban, sp ur urban spot. Uh, I also did her um, country garden out in Santa Caponic. Uh, again, out in the um, right on this one being right on the Atlantic Ocean, uh, five acres, um, and, and this one has a story. So, the house that's here used to be here, and we had uh, it existed that way for ten years, uh, and then a series of nor'easters, which we get eroded the dune and threatened the house, and we had 24 hours. Uh, to move the house. Luckily, Barbara had uh, purchased the potato field on the other side um, of uh, Potato Road. So a detail of the garden as it evolved. So after we moved the garden, or after we moved the house, to open up the pool that had pre-existed, that we had, uh, was the first swimming pool I designed in 1986, uh, we had to build a structure. We had to have a house. You can't have a pool without a house. So uh, we commissioned an architect to design the pool or to design the house. That existed for about another 10 years. And then this property actually came for sale. Barbara tore the existing house down to open up a review from the, from the main house. Uh, and we extended the garden over. So gardens are always changing. They're always evolving. Chili bather. So this is a view of the original house and pool that we designed back in the and built in the late in the late 80s, and this is the way it looks now with uh, with the house moved and the new um, the new pool house on the left on the right. 
we actually were able to use the uh, snow fencing that they use for erosion purposes as the pool fence enclosure, which you see there. What I like about this slide is it really shows how, uh, you know, we really didn't do too much to the dune planting. That's pretty much nature, uh, uh, nature's force there. But it's, it shows how the nature and man kind of come together because everything about uh, halfway in the slide from here over is, is, is designed dunescape. Whereas everything over here is basically the American cord grass, uh, which grows in sand. This details of the, art, we, uh, the architect here was Elizabeth Dimitriades um, from uh, Manhattan. Barbara had wanted the uh, pool house to kind of be more sympathetic to the, um, to the old shingle style. And I said, Barbara, this is really our opportunity to do something and make a modern statement. This uh, garden is also uh, in, the, in the show over there. She has a real fascination with purple. So we have about uh, 13 different types of allium uh, going on in this garden that bloom pretty much all spring and summer. <clears throat> we um, work with Seabird and Rice, or they actually invited us to design a pot for them. Uh, and I said, well, we never just do one pot. We, we, uh, <laughs> we like to do collections of pots whenever we're placing uh, uh, containers in, in a garden. And uh, so we designed three. One, uh, we, and we drew from nature for inspiration, uh, this being inspired by a cattle lily, this being a um, hellebore, and this uh, a cardoon or uh, artichoke. These were uh, designed in our office and then fabricated in Italy and now are available for sale. It's really kind of an exciting project. A little bit further east, um, this is the renovation of an old farmhouse uh, that was added on to uh, many times. It was a young, active family that actually did not want any lawn um, uh, on their property. There's about a one acre property uh, a half mile from the beach, so we wanted to uh, kind of uh, bring the dunescape into this uh, uh, isolated lot. They're also very close to farm fields, so we wanted to actually, you know, bring the idea that you're in the country and close to the farms as well. So both of those landscape <coughs> were used as, as inspiration. <clears throat> uh, uh, going north of New York City in Purchase, New York, uh, is the uh, is Sky Meadow Farm uh, that we I've again been working on for about 30 years, and also in the exhibition. Uh, it's about a nine-acre uh, property. Uh, another model that we did. Uh, this client in particular could not read plans at all, so a model was a uh, a very important uh, very important tool. And basically what we did here is just res uh, do garden rooms adjacent to uh, the, en the entry door, a kitchen garden off of the kitchen, dining uh, terrace off of the dining room, and a living, uh, living room garden off of the living room, and a secret <coughs> garden off of the master, master bath. Kitchen garden, dining terrace, and the entry gate into, the, um, into this uh, secret garden. I was talking to students uh, this afternoon that residential clients really push, uh, push our limits and push us in directions we never dreamt of going. Uh, we can then use those, uh, that process and the expertise that we gain in residential uh, to bring down the cost of design when we're doing commercial and institutional work because most of the uh, commercial and institutional work uh, won't, the fees won't allow for us to design what we can do in residential. So the learning curve is a lot less when we kind of translate some of the detailing that we do um, uh, in residential to commercial and institutional. 
This is the New York Botanical uh, Garden in the Bronx. Uh, this is the native garden. Uh, we actually used a sculpture by Martin Purrier as inspiration for this uh, water feature element. This water feature element is not only just for aesthetic purposes, but it's also recirculating uh, storm water, so it's part of the overall garden's uh, storm water management uh, uh, process. It was to be distinctly uh, contemporary with uh, it, the use of hardscape, and again, accentuate the seasons. All the boardwalks were uh, uh, from American um, uh, locust trees, and so were the benches. It's a very hard material and lasts for a very long time. Uh, there's a shade garden component in this garden, uh, as well as uh, a, a, a sun-loving garden as well. One of the older gardens uh, that garden spaces that we renovated uh, as part of uh, the New York Botanical Garden. <clears throat> Another residential project that um, we actually did twice. Uh, this uh, house was actually built by the man who built the New York subway system. So we had um, a lot of stone uh, to work with. Uh, and we worked with John Murray Architects out of New York City in the um, design of the structures. Swimming pool looking back at the house. It's uh, right on the Long Island Sound. Uh, looking across at Playland, for those of the, you who are familiar with the Westchester, New York area. <clears throat> Up the coast, this is Darien, Connecticut, also on Long Island Sound. This was a home that had been lived in by Charles Lindbergh uh, when he moved there from New Jersey. Um, and our client uh, renovated it with Austin Diston Patterson, uh, a local uh, New York architect. And again, this garden lays down in a storm and bounces up uh, as soon as the sun uh, dries everything out again. <clears throat> this is uh, demonstrating some of the shoreline revetment. Uh, the, uh, over the years, the, this coast had really uh, eroded. And working with the state of Connecticut, Department of Natural Resources, uh, we are allowed to put in both lateral and parallel groins. So we actually added, uh, uh, we, we added land to this property and restored it with Spartina patens and Spartina alternifolia uh, to create a natural barrier rather than a rip-wrapped shoreline. Um, <clears throat> this is a 100-acre horse farm that I did in uh, North Salem, uh, New York. Uh, this is where uh, doing marriage counseling uh, can really work because in this case, the uh, uh, husband really wanted native plants and native trees and the uh, wife was really into her horses. And to blend those two together, you see how much the horse landscape uh, can really consume a lot of land. Just the, uh, just the outdoor riding rink is absolutely enormous. It's like four uh, tennis courts, and we all know how big they are, and of course, um, all the paddocks. So blending those two things together uh, was, was our task. Uh, we did a, a designed meadow of natives around the house, and then these, this larger area, we work with Larry Weiner, um, who I call my meadow man, uh, in, and, that was, and that was a seeded meadow. Detail of the house precinct. This is uh, showing the difference between a seeded meadow and a uh, the abstracted uh, design meadow around the, one of the stormwater management uh, ponds that we did. So this is all container plants. This is all seed. And sometimes you don't have to plant at all. This is just controlled mowing. So the, uh, the low lawn is, is mowed uh, every week. Uh, the, and in other areas, we just allow the uh, grass to grow uh, in, 
mowed maybe every other every other season. So it really reduces your cost when you can when you can do that. This is what the garden looks like when we first put it in with all container plants. Uh, the detailing here, we used all the stone from the site. It's about a 100 acre horse farm uh, with lots of, uh, lots of natural boulders. And again, we wanted it to look like it was always there. This is what it looks like on day one when we lay out all the plants. And then as it, as it grows in, this is the swimming pool complex. This is a negative edge or perimeter overflow swimming pool, which really increases your re reflectivity uh, and makes it uh, feel very much like a, um, like a pond. So you see the uh, dry coping on the left and then the wet coping. All the water is spilling over. Oops, it's going up here. Anyway. This, in this particular 100 acres, we only used uh, native plants, Agastache and little blue stem and Parthenium here. And this is a garden we did with Thomas Pfeiffer. So as I said in my opening statement, you know, our palette uh, can apply to both uh, a traditional architecture as well as soaringly modern architecture. Uh, in this particular case, they had started the landscape uh, uh, prior to us and they started doing vista clearing and unfortunately um, they exposed a lot of the root systems. It was very shallow topsoil on, very, on shale uh, uh, sub, uh, subsurface and through a series of um, winter storms it essentially washed all topsoil downstream. It was this whole site when we, Jim and I first came here was completely denuded and it looked like a parking lot of shale. There wasn't a one morsel of topsoil left. We could not bring topsoil back. It was just prohibitively expensive. So we worked with a, um, a, a soil scientist to amend the shale and it far exceeded our expectations. Uh, so essentially this is not uh, planted in topsoil. We've done a lot of work up and down the, uh, the, the East Coast. This is a mile of beachfront um, on, on Nantucket. We're again working with a native plant material uh, in creating a dunescape that sweeps right up to the, uh, the dwelling itself while preserving some areas for lawn for the family activities. Shade's really important. Um, uh, this furniture was made uh, from driftwood that was found on the beach. Uh, this is a project I just finished planting um, uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, it, you can actually see uh, Vermont, New York, uh, New Hampshire, and a piece of Connecticut from this uh, vantage point, a uh, 400 acre uh, mountaintop retreat. Uh, the client in this case uh, wanted to create a water wheel house on top of a mountain. Uh, she had seen uh, All That Heaven Allows, which is, was a movie back in the 50s uh, with Rock Hudson and Jane Wyman. And it's a very sweet story about a family that uh, grows up in a, in a well house. Uh, however, she had a mountaintop retreat and uh, uh, wanted to recreate the scene in the movie. So. It's basically, we designed a, a 65 foot uh, water feature that uh, uh, has a source up here, falls down. This area is recirculated. Uh, we created the illusion that it actually goes through the house, um, out of flume, turns, uh, turns the water wheel, and then continues uh, uh, down the slope. You don't do one of these every day. <laughs> Here's the, basically all the uh, water feature is uh, concrete construction. And then uh, we have, these are all boulders uh, from this site uh, that were placed. See, see during the, because we're very involved in the actual placement of the boulders in this case. 
Uh, it was, it's a hand-made uh, water wheel. We were trying to recreate the uh, era of 1832. Um, so everything had to be uh, done by hand. And here's uh, planting day and a picture of the uh, water wheel act actually uh, functioning. So it was very Disney, Disney-like. I'm uh, moving up the coast. This is Prout's Neck, Maine. Uh, clients of mine in Greenwich, Connecticut bought a, a, a coastal property in uh, Prout's Neck, which is where Winslow Homer had done uh, his famous uh, paintings, dramatic landscape. And again, trying to create something that looks like it was um, always there. All native stone, all native plant material. Again, uh, work with uh, Ben Forgey, who is a furniture maker who collects where, wherever we go. He collects driftwood um, from the shore and, uh, and makes the garden, garden furniture. So it really blends in. It's Casco Bay. I'm uh, gonna uh, show you one of our academic uh, projects we did at the University of Virginia. Uh, th that is Alderman Library. Uh, in the distance and the uh, fairly new uh, small uh, special collections uh, uh, library on the left. Uh, this garden is all over structure. So uh, waterproofing again becomes very important. Some of the most important papers in, uh, in, in America are housed underneath this garden. Uh, that's uh, one of Jefferson's original ash trees right here that we actually uh, raised the level of the soil up uh, covering six feet of the tree's roots. We did it with expanded shale. We mainly did this so that we could achieve ADA compliance. Um, I was really nervous about touching one of uh, Jefferson's um, ash trees, uh, but th this was done um, uh, we did this back in 2004, and the tree is still as healthy, nearly as healthy as it was when we uh, filled around its roots. Uh, this is a property along the banks of the Rappahannock River in Virginia. Uh, this, this property actually was originally deeded uh, 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 from King Carter uh, to this family, it's been in the same family um, since then, so going on uh, 300 years. Uh, in this case, it was uh, a 19th century farmhouse that we worked on, uh, and being from U University of Virginia, I did borrow from Mr. Jefferson at Monticello and creating a, a winding way of our own here. Uh, in this garden, uh, it's featured with a very large um, uh, lotus pool, and what we were trying to do here is really blend the, um, uh, the garden with the view of in the middle ground of the agricultural fields and then the five miles of uh, Rappahannock River uh, that, um, that the family owns. Moving a little bit um, further south, actually that should be Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, we work with, uh, uh, on a historic house there uh, and basically redid the hardscape uh, and the planting, blending, blending old uh, with the new. Uh, further south in Kiowa Island, this is a project we did with Shope Reno uh, Wharton Architects uh, out of Greenwich, Connecticut, kind of the masters of the, of the shingle style. Uh, in most of our coastal properties, we have to raise, you know, because of uh, coastal flooding, we had to raise this, the first floor of the house, up 17 feet above uh, the existing conditions we found. So to kind of terrace this so it didn't look like the house was built on stilts was, um, uh, w was key. And we did that with a series of ha-ha walls uh, that um, kind of raise the elevation and transitions down to the existing topography. And a view out to the Rice River. Uh, 
<clears throat> going north to Chicago. This is Glencoe, Illinois. Uh, we've done seven different projects at the, um, at the Chicago Botanical Garden. This was our, our first project there, which not only blended perennials, but also introduced some annuals into this, uh, into this garden. We've done three bridges uh, for them. This is actually the trellis bridge, which was designed so that uh, the vines will actually follow the railing uh, from one side of the uh, bridge to the other. In St. Louis, uh, we've been working on uh, Forest Park, uh, which is their urban landscape park. Um, it's actually a third larger than Central Park. Uh, it was the site of the 1904 World's Fair. And uh, after the World's Fair pulled out, it basically left a potmarked landscape of unconnected waterways uh, that the city was uh, maintaining with Roundup through most of the 20th century as um, St. Louis was coming close to the centennial of the World's Fair, they thought something had to be done and they created a river return project. We actually couldn't um, bring the river back because this was the basin for the river de Pair that ran through the park, which was buried up to 250 feet below the park for the World's Fair. We couldn't bring it back because it was, had essentially become an urban sewer, uh, but we did reconnect all the um, lagoons and waterways to uh, basically it's a it's a river theater. This is Pagoda Circle and again the planting is supposed to be reminiscent of the uh, what had been the pre-existing wet savanna uh, that ran uh, ran through the park. And we're actually still working on this project. Uh, they're doing another phase as we speak. I'm almost done now. Uh, this uh, change in scales here, this is a, a 10,000 acre uh, sculpture park that we did in Montana. Uh, it also has a capacity for, um, uh, uh, for outdoor uh, concerts. Uh, this was a study we did of other similar sized projects just to, for us to get an understanding of the scale. You see the island of Naoshima the famous uh, uh, Tadayo Undo art island in, in the uh, 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 Japan Sea. Uh, you have the size of Marf Marfa here uh, and uh, Storm King there. So it, it's a landscape of vast scale. My partner Lisa Delplace uh, won a national uh, ASLA design award for this project. Some of our early design sketches for the um, outdoor amphitheater. Uh, uh, solar, the, the entire property is self-sufficient. Um, um, everything self-contained. We work with a number of uh, amazing artists in placing a very large sculpture uh, throughout, the, um, uh, throughout this 10,000 acre Park. And um, I'm real happy with this project. We just planted it uh, this past fall and it was just uh, opened and dedicated. This is the uh, American Museum uh, in Britain outside of Bath in an old uh, 18th century manor house that had been converted to a museum in 1960 uh, by Dallas Pratt. Uh, it was 125 acres that we uh, originally did the master plan for the, um, for the entire property and broke it down into a series of different campuses. This museum was established to really tell the American uh, story, um, uh, both uh, history and decorative arts that are in the museum. So our goal here was to show uh, American landscape, uh, uh, American landscapes through time um, in, in, the, in the various campuses. Uh, the, first, uh, the first phase is called the New American Garden um, we, and we incorporated an outdoor amphitheater. And uh, this garden I actually laid out in 
in uh, the first week of June. Uh, they wanted to do a trial uh, layout and it basically started blooming right away when we planted the rest of the garden in September of this year. Everything was still blooming. The thing I learned about uh, gardening in England and it's the reason why they're such great, they're known for their gardens, things bloom all summer long from May till October. Uh, I, I'm sure down here in, in, in the mid, middle Atlantic where I do a lot of the work, things bloom in June and everything starts kind of turning ever gold by uh, July and August. But here everything blooms all summer long. It was just, it was, uh, it was just astounding. Anyway, um, I have a closing statement here. Um, in conclusion, I'd like to uh, quote Will Hagenall, who was the chairman of the board of the uh, Chicago Horticultural Society, uh, wrote of the gardens we did for Chicago, and I think it has um, some relevance for all of our work. The cumulative experience of this new complex of gardens, terraces, and bridges is one of heightened sensory pleasures. It encourages each of us to go slowly, to linger, to allow nature to nourish the human spirit. Thank you very much.